Sweet. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Scott McCormick, and this is the remote version of the Wednesday night men's class for Cartersville First Baptist. We've been going through the Gospel of John. We're finally in John chapter 2. And before we get started reading, um, I'll pray, and then we'll dive into the Word. How does that sound? All right. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you and praise you for this opportunity. This is something that's enabled um, by your providence, that you have allowed us to come together virtually, remotely, in a way that allows us to still stay in touch and to dwell together in your word in the midst of a very tragic and awkward time in our history. Uh, Lord, there are some who can't come today because they're sick from the very virus that's keeping us apart, and I pray that you would do a work of healing in their life. I pray that those who are not able to come to church because there's no services would still stay in your word on a regular basis because your words give life and that without, without Christ in our life, we have no light in our life. So I pray that you would, you would keep us honest uh, in our walk with you, that you would keep us regularly attending to scripture and that you would help us to understand it in ways that we didn't understand it before. I pray that you would do that tonight as, as, uh, as we walk through the Gospel of John. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for all of the good that you do in our lives, including this. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so, um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, I usually do, like, read down the row in, cl in a classroom, but that does not work online. So I'm going to call out you to you by name to read a portion and uh, we'll just do it that way. So um, we're going to be reading in John chapter 2, and before we do that, let's do just a tiny bit of review so we remember where we are, because that sort of gives us a little bit of context. Um, last week, let's see, here's the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River and Bethany, and a couple weeks ago we were in Bethany as John the Baptist was giving witness of, to who Jesus was. And then Jesus decides to go to Galilee, and there's a city there called Nazareth, that's where Jesus is from. And then where does he go? Where did we study that he went last week and ended up at a wedding? Where was that? Cana. Cana. And that's, that's in the city of Cana. Now, this is the same Cana that Nathaniel is from. Nathaniel's one of his disciples and was probably with him when he came here. He was one of the five that we uh, studied about follow Jesus starting in John chapter 1. When they left Cana, they went at the end of um, the last lesson last week, they went to a place called Capernaum, which is probably, I don't know, somewhere over here on the, they, they don't know exactly where it is, but Capernaum was on the Sea of Galilee. And they just stayed there a few days because they went from there to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's way down here. Jerusalem. And so if from Bethany to Cana was about three days journey from Capernaum to Jerusalem was probably about a week that it would have taken to get there. And that's where we're going to start in verse 13. We've, we've, we're now traveling down to Jerusalem, and that's where Jesus is going to stir up all kinds of trouble. So I'm going to start with you, Ben. If you will read for me John chapter 2. Let's see. I'm breaking all my traditions here. My name's Mr. Scott. And we're in John chapter 2. All right, so if you'll read for me John chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. And then Billow, you're next on my screen. If you'll read verses 18 through 22. And then David, if you'll read 24 through 25. And don't worry, there are a lot more references for us to read. Hey, Pete. I got yeah. some singing in the background on yours. Can you mute for a minute until oh, okay. it's your turn? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, Ben, you can go ahead and start. All right, chapter 2, verse 13. <clears throat> the Jewish Passover was near, so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple complex, he found people selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and he also found the money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple complex with their sheep and oxen. 
He also poured out the money changers' coins and overturned the tables. He told those who were selling doves, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And his disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for, the, for your house will consume me. The Jews then answered and said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, the many people saw the miracle, miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. Very good. So Jesus here has come to Jerusalem for a particular event. And what is that event? Passover. The Passover. This was a celebration, a remembrance of the Israelites' miraculous escape from, uh, from Egypt when the angel of death came as a plague upon Egypt and passed over the Israelites because they obeyed the Lord and painted the blood of the sacrificial lamb on their doorposts. And when the angel of death found that blood on the doorpost, it passed over. And they continue to celebrate that event. It's a big deal in their society. And so he came down from Capernaum to Jerusalem to participate in this fast Passover feast. And when he arrives, the first place he goes is to the temple. And there's something we need to know about the temple. that The temple is constructed in the fashion of the tabernacle uh, that... Moses instructed, and these are kind of squiggly lines, but bear with me here. And so it was in this concentric rectangular shape. This, this court out here is the outer court or the court of Gentiles. And this is where Gentiles could go. If, if you were a proselyte, you could go there to worship. You could go in there. And then there was the inner court that the Jews were allowed to go in. And then in the very center, this is the Holy of Holies. This is uh, the place where only one time a year could somebody even go in that room. And that was the high priest who, who was serving that year. And inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant, the golden lampstands, the bread of the presence. Um, the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments were inside the Ark. Aaron's staff that budded was there. This was a very sacred place. And so these are the three sort of um, regions, in major regions inside the temple. And in the outer court, in the court of the Gentiles, Jesus finds something not right. There is something in this court that makes him really upset. And what does he find in this outer court? Marketing. There's some marketing going on. In verse 14, it says, In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. So these animals that they were selling were used for the sacrifices, for different kinds of sins and different kinds of sacrifices. There were different animals prescribed by the law and how they were to be sacrificed and what you were to do with the bodies, things like that. So it was a requirement in order to perform many of the activities of worship in the temple to have these specific animals. And let's say that you're a Jew who didn't live in Jerusalem. You had to travel a long way to get there. You may not have brought your own animals. You may have brought money to then buy an animal and then go through the sacrifice. Well, so as a matter of convenience, rather than do all of that marketing out here on the outside of the temple, they set up shop inside. And they had tables and booths all over the place to sell cows, and, um, I'm sorry, oxen, sheep, and pigeons. There's also another word here, money changers. What do money changers do? 
having to get the correct currency. Right. They, they, they were sort of doing a, a currency exchange. So like, let's say you go to another country, even today, if you were to travel to Europe and you wanted to buy things in Europe, you can't use the US dollar. You would need whatever the currency is in that region, a euro or a franc or a krugerrand or whatever they, they, they would accept as payment. In the temple, there was a particular coin, the didrachma, that was used and required in order to pay the temple tax. If you didn't have this coin, you couldn't pay the tax. So if you came from a long way from another country that had different currency, you would need to exchange it for the didrachma, and then you could pay the temple tax as a part of the, uh, the worship service. Uh, this is the same didrachma that uh, I think it was, um, when did we do First Peter? Last semester? And they go into the temple and somebody comes up to Peter and says, does your master pay the temple tax? And Peter, not even really thinking about it, says, uh, well, yeah, sure. Not thinking that Jesus is the Lord of the temple and all of it belonged to him. And so he wasn't really bound by that rule. And so Jesus ends up sending him on a fishing expedition and inside the fish's mouth is two didrachma coins to go and pay the temple tax for himself and for Jesus. So here, that's why this is going on. It, this is happening inside the temple because it provides a convenient service for people. But what was the purpose of the temple? Why, why had it been constructed? Was it constructed to act as a marketplace so that people could then participate in worship? Jesus doesn't seem to think so. He thinks that this is an inappropriate use of this temple space. And so he goes off and makes something. What does he go make? Whip. He makes a whip, <laughs> which is, I think is great. I, you know, there's, I, you, I gotta draw Jesus with a whip here, okay? So here's Jesus, and here's this giant whip that he's got. And I can honestly draw it that big because my brother owns one of these whips. He, my brother is a farmer. He has cows, and he has donkeys, and he has all sorts of animals. And before he even had a farm, he thought it would be cool to have a real bull whip. And so he had a buddy of mine who makes these things, and they are long. I'm talking, I'm talking seven or eight feet long of leather cords bound tightly together. And, and if you whip it nice, you can make a really good crack with it. I mean, it is a nice tool. So Jesus makes this whip. It says, in making a whip of cords, which by the way, he did this, he started doing this after he arrived, which means he gets there, sees what's in the temple, walks out, and goes and makes a whip. This is not a one-hour activity. This is, it, he took some time to make this happen. In verse 15, it says, in making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. Now, I don't think he was whipping people, okay? Because the people there, their job was to manage the animals, to keep the animals and to sell the animals. And what he wanted out was the people, but he drove them out by driving out their animals. You crack that whip and the oxen and sheep are gonna start moving. And the people are gonna walk right behind him and follow him out. That's, that's, my, that's my merchandise and it's walking out of the temple. They're gonna follow them out. It says he poured out the coins all right, so did we get to see Jesus doing a little table flip here. All right, here's his table, and there's coins that are spilling out everywhere. And the people that have been standing there selling coins aren't stopping him. He pours out the coins, and he overturns the tables. And then he tells those who sell the pigeons, take these things away. Well, the pigeons are, where are pigeons kept? How would they have been kept in the temple? Probably in cages of some Probably sort. Probably in cages. So here's some pigeon cages. I'm sorry for those of you who don't have video, but these are some of my best stick figures ever. All right, so we got pigeons in cages, and, and you can't really whip a pigeon. You, you can't scare a pigeon into leaving the temple by whipping it. So he talks to the people, and he says, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. 
So here he's driven out the sellers of oxen and sheep with his whip. He's turned over the money changers tables and poured their coins on the ground. Now their business is kind of crumbling away in front of them. They got to scramble all this stuff up and get out. And he tells the pigeons, the, the sellers of the doves and pigeons, he says, take these things away. Grab your baskets, grab your um, cages and walk out with them. Try to imagine in your mind what it would have looked like <coughs> to stand in the temple and watch him do this. Now, what I want you to think about is inside the temple on any given day, there were upwards of 2,000 people within its walls. And yet not one person lifts a finger to stop him. There was probably even more than that because it was Passover time. It was Passover time. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a crowd there. This was a big booming business time for, for the marketers inside the court of the Gentiles. <clears throat> In addition to that many people there, there would have also likely been the temple guards whose job it was to maintain order in the temple. And here comes Jesus with a whip. One man, one whip, and he drives, it <clears throat> says, them all out of the temple. What Scott, a feat. You know, if it was, were they breaking any laws by being in there? Like, no. I, I wonder if, like, they knew they were breaking laws, and that's why no one said anything to him whenever he kicked them out. Well, that's one, uh, that's one theory. So that's, you know, when, when you get to why and how, how did he pull this off? Like, why did nobody lift a finger? <laughs> why did nobody say, no, I'm going to stay? And I'm glad you asked that question because this was allowed – by the, the governing authorities at the time. That's why the, the, the Jews in just a minute, the Pharisees and the, the temple, um, those who were in service in the temple, were, got mad about this because it had been allowed for a long time. And they want to say, well, wait a minute. We thought this was okay. What authority do you have to change it? There's also a sense in which if they thought they were guilty, then, then who can stand against him if they really are you know, the, the guilty party here? I think there's something even more, a little bit higher at play here because of who's involved. We're talking about the same man who pulls a similar stunt um, in John. Let me see. Flip with me to John chapter 18. We're still in the book of John. Keep a finger in John chapter 2 because we'll be back. But in John chapter 18, we see the account of Jesus's betrayal and arrest. Jesus has now gone to the Garden of Gethsemane. He went there to withdraw and to pray with his disciples before he was to be betrayed and arrested and then crucified. And while he's there and praying, Judas rounds up a bunch of guards to go arrest him. So I want us to read um, John chapter 18 verses 1 through 8. And let's see, next on my screen is Luke's friends. Can one of you, do y'all have a Bible with you out there in the park? Yeah, I can do it. Awesome. Read for me John chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. 1 through 8, got it. <clears throat> when Jesus had said these things, he went forth with his disciples over the brook, Cadron, where there was a garden into which he entered with his disciples and Judas also who betrayed him near the place because Jesus had often resorted hither together with his disciples. Judas therefore having received a band of soldiers and servants from the chief priests and the Pharisees cometh hither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore knowing all things that should come to him went forth and said to them whom seek thee? They answered him. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus, Jesus saith to them, I am he. And Judas also who betrayed him stood with him. As soon therefore as he had said to them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Again therefore he asked them, whom seek thee? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore thee seek me, let these go their way. Very good. So here we see Jesus in the garden, and I'm going to draw him sort of by himself here. And, and here there's a bunch of soldiers who have come to arrest him, and they brought weapons, spears, and swords like this. 
and, and he addresses them first and says, whom do you seek? They say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says, I am he. Now, I want us to note when he says, I am he, in our translation, it says, I am he. In the Greek, it just says, I am. In other words, this is the same name that, that the God Yahweh gives to Moses when he says, who are you speaking to me from the burning bush? And he says, I am. This is the name that Jesus uses. And the very power of his response drives these men onto the ground, onto their knees. They fall backwards and fall down to the ground. All he did was speak. We see this, this in, in the power of his speech, he can knock men over. And this is the same man that in the temple, when he goes running around with a whip, cracking the whip and driving them out, saying, take these things from here. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. They go running. And I think that gives us a really good sense for how he pulled this off, that this was not something done by natural means. This was not a brawny Samson kind of a man, you know, slaying a thousand men with a jawbone. This was Jesus speaking, not laying a hand on a single person and yet driving them all out of the temple. Scott, I have yes, a question. Sir. Yes, sir. We often have guest speakers at our church and guest vocalists. Mm -hmm. They set up tables in our lobby and sell discs and other items that they have, uh, books and whatever. Yeah. What's different? Well, so what's important to remember here is what the purpose of this particular area was in the temple. I can give you a what I think. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to sort of overextend the point that's being made here. To, to counter things that are going on at a particular church. But I can say that in the temple, um, particularly in the court that they were in, this court right here, the, the outer court of the Gentiles, the point of that court was to, to provide ease of movement and a quiet place of study and contemplation and prayer for Gentiles. This was, this was their place of worship. And if a Gentile came into this portion of the temple, and it was intended to be the place where they were to contemplate and to study and to worship and to be in prayer and to participate in the sacrificial aspects of worship. You know, there was an altar there. Um, and they come in and they've got to push around the money changers and they've got to get past the guys hawking the nice animals. And, and it, it really just looks like a bazaar and not a place of worship. That's what was going on wrong here. It was not a holy place. It was not a set-aside place. So there are places in your church where, in our church, where um, we go to do worship. We, we have quiet places for contemplation and prayer. We have places for public worship where we sing songs and listen to sermons. Um, it, it would be very inappropriate for us to turn those places into a marketplace. Uh, but there, you know, sometimes there are ministries that we want to um, help out by buying things and whatever, and that's out in a hallway or in, in an entryway. I don't think that's too inappropriate. You know, there, there were vestibules here where people came in. Um, there are other rooms that are not typically drawn on here where other things went on, where stuff were stored and things like that. So no, I don't think it's inappropriate to do that. Now, my, I was talking about this with Tracy, my wife. And she told me about when she used to sell Girl Scout cookies as a little girl. And she would often sell them to people at church. And, and, and they would say, hey, Tracy, I want to buy Girl Scout cookies from you. And she would say, okay, I can sell you Girl Scout cookies, but we can't do it in the sanctuary. We need to go out into the entryway or to some other place in the church building to do that. And they, she said they were always really impressed. Wow, that's great. Yeah, that's, I totally get that. And I think that's the sense that we get here, that this part right here in the sanctuary is intended for a purpose, and that purpose is not market. So does, does that answer your question? Well said. Awesome. Excellent. I'm glad you asked it. So, um, so, so we see here the power of the man who speaks to them and the response that he gets. Uh, I mean, this temple just empties. They all run out. And the people who have been watching are probably in deep amazement 
And I want us to note a few things here. Um, here in verse 16, let's see who's next. Um, Luke, it says you're on a separate iPhone. Are you here with us, Luke? I'm here. Awesome. Can you read for me, reread for me, John chapter 2 and verse 16? Sure can. 2, 16. And he said to those who sold doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Very good. He says, do not make my father's house. My father's house. This was a, a special thing. He, he, he consistently referred to the father as his father. And here he's referring to the temple as my father's house. Well, there's something that I haven't mentioned here yet. John is recounting this story of Jesus cleansing the temple towards the beginning of his ministry. If we were to look at a timeline, I'm going to draw it up here. We, we've got his baptism. Uh, we've got 40 days in the wilderness. He meets his, some of his disciples after his return. And a few days later, he goes to Cana for a wedding, and now he's in Jerusalem, and he cleanses the temple. Well, in the other Gospels, two of the other Gospels, I think at least, there is a, a recounting of him cleansing the temple, but it doesn't happen here on this timeline. It happens Way down here, three years later, in the week before his crucifixion. So there's the cross. We've got the week leading up to that. This is the, the Passover celebration. And when he arrives, this is when he cleanses the temple. When he arrives after the triumphal entry, that's when he cleanses the temple and the other Gospels. Well, this is easy for us to, to understand this conflict. They're recounting two different events. We can kind of kind of gather that from reading the different accounts and the differences in them. So turn with me, keep your finger in John chapter 2, and turn with me to Matthew. We're going to be in Matthew 21. I'm going to write that up here. Let's see, we've been to John 18. We're going to go to Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Here we go. I think it's back to me to read. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 12. This is right after the, the section right before this is the triumphal entry. When he comes into town riding on a donkey, they shout Hosanna, they lay down palm leaves. And this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And so then in verse 12, in Matthew 21, it says, and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sought and who sold and bought in the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. So we see a difference in the things that he says. The first time he comes, he says, This is my father's house. The second time he comes, he says, This is my house. This is my temple. I'm not an unknown prophet at this point. When he comes riding into town and everybody in town shouts his name, he's known now, and he walks into the temple as a different person to the community. He calls it my house. It, it also, there's some differences in the people that were there trying to sell things. It's just money changers and the pigeon sellers, not sheep and oxen. So we see these are two different events for two different but similar purposes. He's come in as a different kind of person to clear out. It's interesting also to note that if this is at the beginning of his ministry right here, and then the second time he does it is right at the end of his ministry, he sort of bookended the three years of his earthly ministry with cleansing of the temple, of going into the place that's supposed to be a holy place and showing how zealous he is for the Father, for his Father's house. So to me, that's interesting to note. Um, the difference in language there and the difference is in, that he came twice and he actually did it twice. So back in John chapter 2, John chapter 2 in verse 17, it says, His disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal for your house will consume me. Now this is, we're not going to read this, but it's a reference from Psalm 69 and verse 9. You can read that at another time. 
This is them by the power of the Spirit remembering Old Testament scripture that he has taught them and then thinking about the events that he did and going, yeah, I remember when that happened. And that's a fulfillment of prophecy. So in verse 18, the Jews are not happy about this. They're, well, not happy is probably an understatement. Mm -hmm. They're a little, they're a little upset. They're probably quite angry with him because he's come in and not only has he, <laughs> has he driven all the people out of the temple, he has now offended their authority, their, their reasoning, their, um, the dissensions that they had made, the things that they had allowed the people to do. And so what do they ask him for in response? Proof. Authority. Yeah. They say, I, what, Scott, you think that they're more upset about the, the money changers or are they more upset that he said my father's house? Um, <laughs> the, the Pharisees would probably might be more upset about that statement than the money changers. Yeah. They, they got <laughs> upset about that a lot. Um, <laughs> the only thing, that they question here, they say, what sign do you show us for doing these things, not for what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, true. ultimately, um, he, he calls the father, his father, many times, and they, they immediately call him out on that for blasphemy. They don't in this case right here. Um, but had they heard it, because he was speaking to the, you know, the sellers of pigeons and doves when he said it, had they heard it, I'm sure they would have been pretty upset about it. <laughs> So here they ask for a sign. And are they wrong? Here's a question for you. Mm -hmm. Are they wrong to ask for a sign of his authority for doing something so drastic? Well, I think they, at this point, they might be more justified than th three years down the road. You know? Right. Because right. they, you know, they probably hadn't even heard. They possibly hadn't heard about Cana and what happened at Cana. Right. So they might not have seen any miracles yet or heard of any miracles. So that, that might. Yeah. Be, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So um, I will say that there were many examples in Scripture of prophets who proved their authority to act in the prophetic role by performing signs. So think about Elijah when he challenges. The, the worshipers of Baal to say, choose two uh, cows, one for me and one for you. We're going to slaughter them according to the rules here, put them on two different altars. You ask your God to call down fire on yours, and I'll ask my God to call down fire on mine. By the way, go ahead and pour water all over mine so it doesn't accidentally catch on fire. And guess whose God rained down fire on an altar? Elijah's. And that was a sign that his God was real and he had been sent. So they're, they're sort of used to this idea of a sign when Moses came um, to the Israelites uh, from living in the wilderness. And he says, well, what he tells God, well, what if they don't believe that I am who I say I am? He says, well, then I'll give you a sign to show them that you've come from me. So here they are asking Jesus for a sign. You're going to come in here and tell us what's what you're going to come in here and, and act all righteous and, and claim that we're not righteous in what we've been doing. We need to see a sign. And his response to them is interesting because every time the Jews ask him for a sign, instead of pointing to the miracles that he's already done, he gives them a cryptic reference to Old Testament scripture or some other historical fact and how it points to him. So what does he tell them in this instance? What does he give in response as a sign? Destroy the temple. He'll raise it up in three days. That's right. Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. Now, this is imperative. This is command form. Destroy this temple. Now, he's not telling them to destroy it. It's sort of like saying, destroy this temple. Do, why don't you try that? Do that, and if you do, I'll raise it up in three days. Now, they don't understand. They take his statement very literally in this instance.
It says, then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it up in three days? Now, this wasn't like all built in one go over 46 years, that there was, there was um, different additions and addendums and other uh, structures that were sort of tacked onto the temple during that 46-year period. But from the beginning of laying its foundations until the time that they were standing there talking to Jesus was 46 years. And they looked around at the structure in the temple and went, you got to be kidding me. Do you know how much money it's taken? Do you know how much labor it's taken? And you're really going to raise it back up in three days. They take it very literally. In verse 21, what does it tell us that he was speaking about instead? Was it the literal temple or was it something else? His body. It was his body. Now, here's a question. John is writing this many years later. He's writing this in like 60 AD the 60s AD, and he's writing about things that he's remembered, but in the, in the moment, <clears throat> did John understand that that's what Jesus was talking about? I, it's clear that the Jews did not because of their response, but what about John and the other disciples? Did they understand what he was talking about in that moment? In verse 22, it says they remembered it later. Yeah, it says they remembered it later. It says in verse, Villa, why don't you go ahead and read for me verse 22. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Very good. So, I mean, even if he was standing there saying, destroy this temple, and maybe even like patting himself on the chest, Maybe even if he was hinting, they would have had no idea that he was referring to his resurrection three days after being crucified. But when he was resurrected, when he did die on the cross and was buried and three days later rose again, well, uh, my dry erase marker's messed up. There we go. And three days later rises again. Here's the empty tomb. Yeah, like that. You like that? There's an empty tomb. He rises again three days later. <coughs> then they remembered what he said. Oh, I remember when he said that. And he gives them multiple examples of this, where, where he says something to the Jews, they don't understand it, and then later the disciples remember that he said it, and they rightly apply it to what's happened. This is not the only kind of sign like this that he gives. Um, here he's, he's declaring his body as the real temple, that, that the, the fullness of, of Jesus as a spiritual being was one with the man body that he was speaking to them in, in front of them, that his body was the temple, and that the temple that they thought he was talking about was only a type of who he was. They didn't know that. Another example that he gives them at a different time is when they say, give us a sign. And he says, no sign shall be given unto you except the sign of whom? What does he say? Jonah. The sign of Jonah, who spent three days in the body of a whale. So here, there he's talking about being buried for three days and then rising again, just like Jonah. So Jonah was a type of Jesus. In, in other words, he was... He was a, a form, a shadow that pointed to the real Christ so that we would have a visual word picture to think about uh, when that happened. Here he's just given them the same thing. Now, this claim that he's made, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. This comes back to haunt him. Now, that's sort of weird to say look, because Jesus knows what's going to go on here. So it's <laughs> not like he was surprised by what happens. But turn with me to John I'm sorry, that's a lie. Turn with me back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 26 this time. In Matthew 26, we're going to start reading in verse 59. So Matthew 26 and 59. All right, Matthew 26 up here. Jesus is standing before 
the high council in the Sanhedrin. The high priest, uh, Caiaphas, is there. They've brought him in, and they have put him before a mockery of a court to ask him questions about who he says he is, trying to find some false witness against him. Now, let's see. Who's next? Ben, you've sort of reordered yourself on my screen, so it's your turn now. Ben, can you read for me Matthew 26, verses 59 through 63? Sure will. All right, Matthew 26, 59. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false testimony against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they could not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two who came forward said, This man said, I can demolish God's sanctuary and rebuild it in three days. The high priest then stood up and said to him, Don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? But Jesus kept silent. Then the high priest said to him, By the living God, I place you under oath. Tell us if you are the Messiah, Son of God. Very good. So <clears throat> he said this. Th this is... This is him before the Sanhedrin. This is now three years, three years later. He's now entered into Jerusalem at the triumphal entry. He's cleansed the temple a second time. He's participated in the Last Supper with his disciples. He's been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, flogged, brought before the Sanhedrin, and they begin to question him. So this is a full three years after he made this claim, and they're still thinking about it. It's still in somebody's mind. But did they get his quote right? Is that really what he said? No. <laughs> no. He didn't say, I will destroy the temple. I mean, he... For one, he was referring to his own body, and he does not destroy his own body. He lays down his life, allowing others to destroy it. But he does not say, I will destroy. He says, destroy this temple. In other words, if you destroy this temple, I will raise it in three days. And so they misquote him. And, and he, he does what he does all the time. He doesn't even engage it. He's like a lamb that's led silent to the slaughter, as it says in Isaiah 53, I think. And so we see here that this, this one sentence that he said three years before now comes back, and they quote it wrongly at his trial. So turn with me back to John chapter 2, and we'll wrap this up. I, I want to point out one other thing, two other things. Two last thoughts. It says in verse 22 of John chapter 2, When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Not only did they believe and think back to these words that he had said, they also believed. Whoa, that's giant. Hold on. Um, they also believed the scripture. Definite article, the scripture. Does it say some scriptures, those scriptures, the scriptures that he was referring to? It says the scripture. They believed the Old Testament scripture that they had available to them and how it pointed to who Jesus was. We get, a, we get a, a, a detailed recounting of what that looks like in Luke. Not you, Luke, but, but Luke the evangelist here who writes the Gospel of Luke. Turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. On the road to Emmaus. The day after Jesus rises from the grave, the day after Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene 
and some other women see the empty tomb. The very next day, there are two of Jesus' disciples who are on the road to a village called Emmaus, and they begin talking to each other and discussing the things that have gone on in that week about what has happened to the master that they had followed. And Jesus, sort of hiding his identity, sidles up next to them and overhears their conversation and asks them to tell him what they've been talking about. And they say, well, don't you know about this, Jesus? It's been so tragic and sad. And now this is what's happened, and we don't know what to do. And David, you're next on my list here. Will you read for me Luke chapter 24, verses 25 through 27, what Jesus' response is to their concern? Verses 25 through 27 of Luke 24. Who's to read that? You, you, David. Uh, he said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Thank you. He doesn't turn to one book that pointed to Jesus. He turns to all of the Old Testament. And as they walked down the road, explained to them how from the book of Genesis until the book of Malachi, all things pointed to Christ. Now, not every single word and every single verse, but as you read it, it is one unified story of the gospel leading up to who Christ was going to come and be. And then the New Testament is an unfolding of the fulfillment of what was pointed to in the Old Testament. Well, and it starts as early as Genesis chapter 3, where we get the proto, what theologians call the proto-evangelion, which means first gospel. When it promises that the son of Eve, that, that, that the sons of Eve, one of the sons of Eve, will crush the serpent's head. That this is a promise that someone will come and will defeat evil and Satan. It, this isn't like specifically saying there's going to be a man that comes and his name's going to be Jesus and he's going to die on the cross, but it's pointing forward to that promise. And so all of scriptures are, are, are wrapped up in, in unity declaring that Jesus is the Son of God and who he is. And here in John chapter 2 verse 22 it says they then they believed the scripture and the word of god and the word that jesus had spoken so that's what it means by the scripture we're talking about all of the old testament pointing to jesus so to wrap up in the last few verses here in chapter john chapter 2 verses 23 through 25 now when he was in jerusalem at the passover feast many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. So here he's doing more signs than just driving the people out of the temple. He, he goes and does signs of healing and other works that are recounted in other gospels. John doesn't give them to us in detail. He just says that the people believed in him but here we get sort of a limiting uh, qualifier on this belief of theirs because it says that Jesus did not entrust himself to him. This same word that the root used for the word believe for those people is also used for him entrusting. And so it's almost as though it says he did not believe in their believing. They believed, but it was at a superficial level. They believed, but it was not a, a total commitment to whom as the Messiah. He did not fully reveal himself to them as the Messiah because they didn't actually believe in him in that way, because he could see who they were. It wasn't just a prophetic vision given from God. This was his own divine power and being able to understand who someone was at the core. We saw a little bit of that in John chapter 1 when he meets Nathaniel and Peter and describes who they are. And, and now we're seeing that he continues to do this as he meets individuals in his life. This isn't just he knows man in general or that he knew the Jews in general. 
these were individuals that he's talking about, that he knows and chooses not to entrust his identity as the Messiah to them because A, they're not ready. It's not part that, that part of his ministry at this time. And they don't really believe in who he was in truth because of his miracles. They, they might have just believed that he, he could do good things or that God had given him power, but not that he was the son of God. And so that, that wraps up John chapter 2. In John chapter 3, we're going to get into some deep stuff. We're going to spend a few weeks on John chapter 3 because Jesus has a conversation with a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, and we're going to see some of the most quoted and most misunderstood verses of Scripture in the world. And I'm talking about John chapter 3 and verse 16. So it's going to be exciting to get into that with all of you next week. Before we go, does anybody have questions or things y'all want to talk about? Scott, I would appreciate your sharing this Zoom technology with Steve Hawkins, who is conducting his Sunday school classes on Sunday morning. Okay. Is he, is he doing Zoom? Is he doing something like this? He's doing something very similar, but not, not this good. Okay. Um, I have a... Through, through my work, I have a paid Zoom account, which allows us to talk for longer than 40 minutes. Um, but you can get a free account and have a 40 minute class like this. It does allow us to, um, you know, for, I'm doing a screen share thing with my drawing tablet and a whiteboard and that helps a lot for illustrations and writing the scripture references, just like I do in class. Um, but yeah, Zoom, I like Zoom because to me, this is, this is a good product. But yeah, no, I can, I can, um, you, you said you want me to reach out to him and send him a, a link to him, tell him about it? If you could, yes. Yeah, he's, he's using a uh, go-to meeting right now. Okay. I've used that in the past, but it's been a really long time. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Luke. I'm glad you came. Yep. Thank you, Scott. All right. Well, um, Billo, so, will, you, will you do me the honor of closing us in prayer before we head out? Surely will. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. And uh, just thank you for Scott's prep. And uh, just thank you, the Lord, even for the technology that is misused in so many ways in this world. It can also be used to glorify your name and and just help teach your word and allow men to gather together, uh, brothers and sisters alike, Lord, to just come together and just worship you and learn your word. Uh, your scripture tells us that we should let your word abide in us as we abide in you. So I pray that this is just one more uh, thing that helps us do that. And so we thank you for it. Pray blessings on those that participated tonight, that they'll just take some of this and continue to meditate on it and it can be a part of them as they move forward in the holy name we do pray amen amen thanks to everybody for coming uh, i mean i've enjoyed it me too man man i miss y'all <laughs> see That's you later the truth. all right see you thanks Scott. see you have, have a good one